Almighty, for gathering us today. Give us the fortitude to conquer life's challenges so we can excel and be upright in everything that we do. Guide us to be united in diversity that we may continue to serve and love one another. Amen. Good morning everyone. Isang magandang umaga ng December 1 sa ating lahat. I'm Joseph Intalan, your moderator for uh, this uh, event, the Education Research Forum. Uh, before we formally start, let me take this opportunity to remind everyone of our health protocols. Uh, please uh, practice uh, physical distancing and likewise get yourself vaccinated once it's your turn. Again, Good morning, welcome to the Education Research Forum, or TERF. The Education Research Forum is the semestral culminating activity of undergraduate research classes in IE. The event is also an opportunity for both pre-service and in-service teachers to deepen their understanding on the direction of education research in the country. Likewise, it's a venue for uh, teachers to share their research. Our program for today, uh, it consists of keynote presentations to be followed by, open, uh, by an open forum for each. And later uh, this afternoon, uh, we will have our student present their research. To welcome us on this semester event, uh, to welcome us on this semester event, let us hear from our dear Dean, Dean Harold Jan Bolala. Good morning, Dean. Good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga sa inyo lahat. Joseph, good morning. Um, I have a very short welcome to all of you because I'm excited to hear our two keynote speakers uh, about uh, their topics. And, and we're very excited about I personally am excited about it because um, the two topics are very close to uh, the core uh, research agenda of the Institute of Education. So um, I was hoping that you can participate more in the discussion later uh, with our two keynote speakers. First, I'd like to welcome you all in this biannual Education Research Forum, or what we call in the Institute of Education, TERF. Uh, I'd like to personally thank our students who are presenting today. I'm sure you're excited as well. Um, and I know that you are probably um, anxious about the outcome of the presentation today, but I tell you, uh, take this as a, a good opportunity for you to experience this kind of presentation. As you move along and graduate, uh, you will see that, that presenting in front of an audience, presenting your idea, presenting your research is uh, one of the many things that you have to do as a teacher or a sports manager or uh, whatever you want to put your uh, skills into. So thank you very much to our students who put together the research uh, this uh, whole day. I would like to specifically thank also our faculty from the Institute of Education who uh, mentored our students, all the uh, faculty in charge and uh, the advisors of all our students. I thank you for taking your time and uh, mentoring our students. It's also special that uh, this turf, we are including uh, business plans for sports science uh, students. And I'd like to thank our faculty and colleagues from the Institute of Accounts, Business and Finance for mentoring our sports science students in developing their business plans. And I'll tell you later how many of them uh, are uh, attending or are creating or have created business plans and you might probably be interested on how sports science uh, under the sports entrepreneurship and innovation projects later in the parallel session. So thank you. I don't know whether they're here. To our IDF faculty, thank you for joining us. Uh, of course, our FE Institute of Education faculty, thank you for joining us. I'd like to um, say thank you to our alumni 
our guests from partner schools who are here. Uh, I was glancing the participants just now and I saw familiar faces. Uh, some of them were, were my former students. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know that you are also excited to come back to FEU physically to see what's happening there. To our alumni, this is an open invitation to our alum. Um, if you have time, uh, probably mid next year, I have a feeling that we are now going back um, in the normal way. No? Because in January, there will certainly be in-person classes um, for uh, all our students no? be uh, starting January. We will release some information about the in-person classes beginning January. So for our faculty, be, be prepared to come back in January uh, because our students from first year to fourth year will come back. No? Um, but again, the mechanics of who will come back uh, from first year to fourth year will be announced uh, very soon. So to our faculty, uh, again, uh, be prepared to come back to, to classrooms uh, in January. Like what Joseph said, um, oh, one more thing to our partner schools who are here. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I know that you have other uh, things to do, but joining us here means a lot. Um, to us in the Institute of Education. Like what Joseph said, TURF is a semester community activity for the undergraduate students, research classes in the Institute, where every semester students present their work in a conference style. This semester, there are 20 projects. Now, nine education research, five sports science and fitness related research, and six sports entrepreneurship and innovation projects. These are the business plans that I mentioned to all of you. So th there are 20 projects that you um, can uh, participate later. You can watch them, listen to them, ask questions. Uh, and to our students, don't be afraid uh, with questions. Uh, questions are very important. Uh, just take it um, as part of your experience. And to our audience, please participate by asking questions, relevant questions to help our students uh, develop their research further. This year's TUR focuses on different research initiatives to strengthen teacher education and sports science disciplines in the Institute. IE is committed in providing quality student experiences, not just only in the classroom, but also outside, so they can be able to be employable immediately after graduation. In fact, in IE, our graduates are employed within one to six months after graduation. So most of our students, immediately after graduation, they're being hired. So we just recently had a survey that our graduates have been employed immediately, one month to six months. The maximum of their waiting period to be employed is six months. So that's a good sign for um, an institute no? that we are being uh, hired, not just only in the Philippines, but also outside no? uh, uh, the country, outside Asia. Uh, even in North America. And I saw a few of them. I saw J.R. Villas uh, watching us today. J.R., thank you for coming. J.R. is our former president of I Student Council and um, uh, a graduate of special education and now um, in the United States. And I don't know who else is here. Um, thank you for joining us. We are very proud of our graduates. Um, I myself is a graduate of the Institute of Education many moons ago. And um, I always say that um, joining the Institute of Education is one of the most um, fulfilling times in my uh, student life. And uh, every time I look back to the times that I was student and I was a junior faculty, um, it, it's it always brings a smile in my face. Um, so we're very proud of our graduates. And just yesterday, we were informed that we achieve a very high passing percentage in the licensure examination for teachers, 94.4%. This is a very good passing percentage in the licensure. In fact, we have been performing very well in the licensure examination for teachers over the last five years. Let's congratulate our new licensed professional teachers by clicking the clap uh, uh, reaction on Zoom to support and congratulate our uh, 
new licensed professional teachers. So congratulations to all our graduates and to our senior students coming in uh, uh, this year and hopefully to take the licensure examination for teachers next year. We are rooting for you. We're excited for you. Uh, this is a testament that we are doing um, uh, excellently in the Institute. So once again, congratulations. <clears throat> Our priorities in the Institute of Education that continue the 87 years of legacy is to maintain academic competence and professional excellence. Um, if you don't know, we are now celebrating our 87th founding anniversary. And we are one of the first institutes open at Far Eastern University. And this 87 years, we have developed or we have graduated uh, thousands of, of teachers, uh, sports leaders, Olympians, uh, national coaches, uh, professional players, uh, sports uh, in, in, in various uh, sports uh, in, in the Philippines. And we have a lot of, like I've said, teachers, not just only in the Philippines, but around the world. So for the 87 years, and we're hoping for alumni to join us in uh, alumni uh, homecoming in the future. I know we just had last month a pocket reunion and it was very successful. We will certainly have another pocket reunion for our alum. So for the 87 years, we are continuing this legacy. That is our motto uh, this year, 87 years, continuing uh, the legacy uh, of providing quality uh, teacher education and sports science programs in the Philippines. Again, I'd like to thank our faculty, academic managers, specifically Joseph, uh, and our non-teaching personnel, the staff who continuously help us uh, developing these programs. Lastly, I'd like to uh, give attention to, uh, to our two keynote speakers, Dr. Rita Puchol, our director for the University Research Center. Thank you for um, uh, joining us today. Um, later, uh, we have a a workshop together with Dr. Kusha. So Dr. Kusha is very busy today. So thank you for joining us. And of course, uh, Dr. Malu Nerikura, she's our Director for Center of Teaching and Learning. Thank you very much for uh, taking your time. Once again, welcome and enjoy the rest of the day. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Harold, for, for that very moving and inspirational uh, welcome remarks. Truly, the activities of the institute you know, is uh, it, it's instrumental you know, to to the legacy and to, of course, to the uh, achievement and to, and and and, uh, and uh, practice of our graduates in the profession. So, thank you so much. Okay, so we will now proceed uh, to our uh, keynote uh, presentation. Uh, please be reminded. Uh, that you may type in your questions in the chat box or raise your virtual hand during the open forum. The open forum would commence after each uh, keynote speaker. Uh, the first to, to deliver the first keynote presentation, which is about research in indigenous education, we have uh, Ma Maria Rita Reyes Cusho. Mam Rita is the Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the University Research Center at Far Eastern University, Manila. She earned her BA in Social Sciences from the University of the Philippines, Manila, her MA in Development Studies with First Class Honors from the University of Auckland, New Zealand, and her PhD in Development Studies from the La Salle University. Her research interests include indigenous peoples, gender, education, and identity politics. Uh, guests uh, and students, let us all welcome our first keynote speaker, Ma'am Maria Rita reyes -Pusha. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, before I proceed, I would like to uh, share my screen first. All right, I hope that, uh, yes, okay. Gonna... All right, thank you. So once again, uh, thank you very much uh, to the Institute of Education uh, led by uh, Dean uh, 
Harold John Tulala, and of course, Sir Joseph Gentalan for this very kind invitation um, to share with our students and our guests um, some parts of the research that I did uh, not not so long ago, um, and this is um, and this is about the research that I did with uh, the indigenous peoples, no, uh, the Aita ni Sambales, no, or the Aita of Sambales in particular, uh, and their learning system. And I um, studied the interface of this learning system with the existing uh, program of the Department of Education called the Indigenous Peoples Education. So I would like to start my presentation by uh, by uh, going through no, what this presentation is going to be. No? So I was given like 20 to 30 minutes to share with you, no, um, to share with you the uh, research that I did with indigenous peoples. And so I will look into um, the indigenous people situation in the Philippines no, and worldwide. And then we will look at the enabling laws and policies um, that are being used no, by government, by the government in order to empower our indigenous peoples. And then I will go into the statement of the problem, which will, of course, guide no, the direction of my research. And then I will share with you a bit of the theoretical framework and the conceptual diagram. And I will focus my presentation on the methodology because I would like to encourage you, no, our dear um, uh, our future educators, no, our uh, dear students and guests to also engage in this kind of uh, research because uh, there is some sort of a scarcity no, of uh, materials related to indigenous research. And if I have more time, then I will also um, share with you a bit of the results and the discussion that I had no, when um, after looking into the data that I have collected in doing this research. So I would like to say no, that this is a 27 year journey that I will try to share with you uh, in, um, in 30 minutes. Um, which started no when I was about your age no so I think many of you are in that you know that age bracket of early twenties so um, I did this when I, I started not doing this research when I was about to graduate from college and this was part of our practicum uh, and that started um, that journey or that relationship with indigenous peoples because um, it was I would describe it as a life changing uh, experience no and that sort of uh, gave me no, the inspiration no, and um, guided me no, uh, in my career as an academic because I have been doing this research since then, no, way back in 1994, when many of you are not yet born. <laughs> so you will see that um, the research that I'm going to do is, I would not say a culmination of, of, uh, you know, of this 27-year journey, but it has been, you know, it has been a guiding, you know, a guiding light, a guiding principle that, you know, that had, that had inspired me you know, for the longest period of time. So um, as an introduction, I would like to say that um, I would like you also to examine your perception or your attitudes when you hear the word indigenous. No? Or in Filipino, we call it uh, katutubo, no? yung mga katutubong Pilipino. And if you look at the history of all indigenous peoples in the Philippines, you will see that this is actually a history of uh, marginalization, oppression, and exploitation. So when we talk of marginalization, no, um, you will see that this means that these people, no, this uh, these groups of people are being deprived of the basic rights, no, that they deserve because they are just uh, they're like you, they are humans like us. But because of their social condition and social position, uh, they do not benefit no, from uh, they, they do not benefit no, from the um, you know from the programs of the government you know and people tend to look down on them and so because of this marginalization this results in their oppression and exploitation. So um, oppression you know has a psychological and political uh, aspect to it. Uh, that means that um, they have been relegated to the silence of the society and that alone is. Um, that alone sort of diminishes no, their dignity as humans. And exploitation also has, um, has that economic aspect wherein uh, they are being abused you know, by, by people no, from all walks of life just because they are different from us. So, and you will see no, that the educational system has not been very fair to indigenous peoples for the longest period of time because we hardly read them in our textbooks, we hardly discuss them in our classrooms. Um, and for the longest, you know, for the longest time, I also recall that uh, I was a victim no, of that educational system wherein we tend to look lowly on indigenous peoples. So um, it is important that when we look at, uh, I, at 
I'll call it IPs, no, at Indigenous Peoples IPs, then we have to acknowledge that they too, like every one of us, um, have the right, no, the right to education. So that means we have to make education um, not only available for them, but this kind of education should also be accessible to them. And it should also be that kind of, you know, there's quality to that kind of education. But of course, when we talk of availability and accessibility, probably we are saying, okay, it's important that we just have that one, um, you know, that, that school in the mountain, no? Uh, or we can probably uh, say that, well, if we ask teachers to go up the mountains, then that should be fine and all that. But uh, the question that we should be asking is, even if we make education available and accessible for them, what is the content of that education? Uh, this discontent of the educational system or the curriculum, no, to be, to be specific about it, does it really reflect and does it validate and legitimize the indigenous worldview, the indigenous knowledge systems and practices? And I think we know the answer to that. But the answer to that is that it's a big, it's a big no. Okay? But we know that when we adopt this rights-based approach to education, then that will result in us, no? in the population, respecting, promoting, and, fulfill and fulfilling the rights of indigenous peoples. So in the Philippines, now we have several um, enabling laws or policies. And we can take pride in the fact that uh, we came up with this pieces of legislation uh, way ahead of even the United Nations. No? So like uh, we had this path-breaking Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act or the EPRA, which was legislated in 1997. Um, and this preceded no, the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was actually passed in 2000, 2007 or 2008. So, um, and this, you know, and this uh, EPRA law was actually a product of the negotiations of, um, you know, of Indigenous peoples, of Indigenous peoples engaging with the state, no, and getting the support of the other stakeholders to ensure that their rights are protected. And as a result of the EPRA, there are now several um, department orders that eventually gave birth to uh, the Indigenous Peoples Education Framework. So, for example, you have DO 101, Series of 2010, which uh, gave some directions on uh, the creation of an alternative learning system curriculum for Indigenous peoples. And then, most especially, in 2011, uh, it was then that the policy framework of the IPED uh, was started. Now, this was under uh, Brother Armin Luistro, who was then the, execu uh, the, was then the Education Secretary. And from there, no, this other, uh, this other department orders um, came up, no, came about. And finally, in 2015, uh, the curriculum framework. So first, you have the policy, no, which uh, laid the, the philosophy of the IP ed. But uh, in 2015, um, the the framework or the curriculum framework was uh, uh, was finally uh, institutionalized by the Department of Education. So by the time that I um, did this research, no, there were already some uh, materials developed. Uh, tra teachers training were already conduct uh, trainings were already conducted, um, and uh, there are there's already you no know, that uh, that awareness that we have to make sure that we gradually integrate the indigenous peoples in the educational system. So uh, my research no um had this one. Uh, question which appeared to be very simple but it's not really that simple no and it took a lot of time to be able to to do this kind of research because this is what we call qualitative research so my question was um how does the ITEL learning system uh recognizing now that uh, they have a unique learning system interface with the IP ed framework of the department of education uh, and in an effort to promote the ITAS cultural rights. So as you can see in the introduction, I'm a faculty of political science uh, way, way before I was, uh, I was the director of the University Research Center. And that is the reason why I was personally interested in discussions about rights, you know, human rights, and specifically cultural rights. So I wanted to look at this because I would like to see if the IP ed framework is actually contributing to the promotion of cultural rights, or um, conversely, it could also be the other way around that the IPN, no, I was thinking that it could also be that the IPN might, uh, might result no, to the uh, diminishing of the cultural rights of, of ITAS because 
uh, their identities as indigenous peoples are gradually being erased by the IPED framework. So those are the things that I had in mind. No? I wanted to see how, uh, first and foremost, uh, that IPED would contribute to the, to the ethnic identity, the strengthening of the ethnic identity, which is actually uh, the anchor no, of the promotion of cultural rights. So I had two um, theoretical framework that guided the, my study. Uh, first is the, uh, I, I think you have encountered this no, as, education, uh, as education students, um, this, uh, this uh, theory of Ivan Illich, which is called uh, the schooling society, which is um, one of the path breaking works no, that uh, critique mainstream schooling. No? And then as a political science uh, major, I also look into the literature uh, uh, or to this material led uh, written by James C. Scott, which is um, entitled The Art of Not Being Governed, an Anarchist History of Upland Southeast Asia. Because uh, here, no, his basic assumption is that the indigenous way of life in the non-state spaces, no, or when you say non-state spaces, those spaces that are hardly entered no, or hardly affected by the state or by the government, is a form of resistance no, to the coercive mechanisms of the state or of the government. So um, these are the two uh, uh, theoretical framework that I used in, um, in analyzing no, the findings of my, of my study. So uh, when I reviewed the literature, no, it's a 27 year journey as I have mentioned. And if I recall the first, um, the first educational issue that I encountered way back in 1994, it is something as simple as this, no? It was just a very simple idea. We were told that, um, you know, we were told that uh, these students hardly go, to the, the Mangyan students hardly go to school, uh, but some teachers would come, but they were being taught westernized, uh, you know, westernized information. Like, uh, for example, let's say um, A as in apple, B as in boy, you know, C as in cat and all that, which, um, which showed that, uh, the educational system was not sen culturally sensitive. And I recall that way back in 1994, that was already you know, a question that was, uh, that was bothering me. You know? And so eventually, when I started reading the literature on, uh, on indigenous peoples and indigenous education, I came to realize that I can organize the materials that I have read into these three uh, major themes. You know? First, um, indigenous education is a critique of westernized of the westernized form of schooling, and then um, indigenous education is also meant to achieve consensus in a diverse society because it can also promote assimilation, the assimilation of the IPs to the mainstream society. Um, and then at the same time, we um, I also found out that there are literature stating that um, indigenous education can also be a form of symbolic interaction. Because the non-indigenous population and the indigenous uh, population would um, uh, relate with each other, interact with each other, negotiate with each other, and come up, you know, with um, with an indigenous kind of education that is both attuned to the creation of a bicultural, uh, a bicultural uh, citizen. Okay, so um, but I would like to also say, you know, that a large that a big influence in my um, in this journey you know, on IP education uh, came about when I was doing my master's studies in New Zealand. Because if you read the literature uh, of indigenous education, you will see that the initiative started you know, in the settler societies like um, you know, the Maori of New Zealand, the Aborigines of Australia, um, you know, and the indigenous peoples and the Native, the, the Native Americans you know, of the United States and of course the Aborigines of, um, of Canada. Uh, and there's, you know, there's already a vast literature on indigenous education in the settler societies because they started in the 1980s. But uh, in the case of the Philippines, um, I think we're a bit delayed. And so therefore, you are, you know, you're actually going to contribute no, and fill in a gap in literature if you decide to engage no, in this kind of uh, in this kind of study. So this is my conceptual diagram. So uh, I'm looking at, of course, the historical and contextual factors, and then the, the cultural rights. And then uh, this is the main, you know, the main uh, focus of my study to look at how uh, the indigenous learning system and the state-driven basic ed curriculum, which is the IP ed, interface with each other. So now I will focus on the methodology because uh, 
I think this is one area which you might be interested in. So here, um, I did my case study uh, among the Aita of Sambales, No, uh, First of all, I would like to call your attention to the spelling. Uh, until I started doing this research, I thought, just like everyone else, I thought that the spelling of Aita was A-E-T-A, -E um, because that is what you read in the, in the literature, right? But when I, uh, when I did my work, uh, my research, I was informed that based on the consultations with the Aita of Sambales, this is actually how it should be explained, or uh, this is how it should be spelled, spelled out. No? And I asked why. And they said that because if you, if you have this Aita, A-E-T-A, -E um, the Aita people will read it as um, Ita, okay, Ita. And in their minds, you know, ita is a the, the word ita is a form, it's a derogatory uh form, no. Um, and it's to me, you know, just just a change in the letter from E to Y is already an important step, no, towards empowerment, because now we are seeing that it is the Ita of the people uh defining who they are, how they want their name to be to be called, or how to how they want their name to be spelled out, or how they want to be how they want to be called, no? So you are not looking at them anymore from the perspective of the colonizer who spelled it as A-E-T-A, -E but uh, you now spell it based on how uh, the Aita people uh, wanted no? uh, uh, their names to be spelled out. And then um, I have this, uh, this mixed methods because um, I was dealing with several groups of people. I was dealing with students on one end, I was dealing with teachers on the other end, and then I was also dealing, of course, with the elders of the community. So later on, I will show you some pictures. So I have no other choice but to use the mixed methods, no? because or to use the mixed method kind of research to make sure that um, I am practicing culturally sensitive uh, research. So what I did you know, was to have semi-structured key informant interviews, I had focus group discussions. I did a bit of observation. And then for the students, I had survey uh, survey questionnaire because the students are already, you know, they're uh, schooled, you know, they're uh, in, in the, the formal school. And so therefore, they can answer my questionnaire. But at the same time, I also have to do uh, secondary research and what we refer to as psikolohiyang Filipino methods. Because once you are in the community no, of uh, IPs, you cannot... Um, you cannot just assume that they are, you know, that they will welcome you and they will be happy to participate and engage with you uh, because they also have a right, you know, as participants. And therefore, we have to use uh, the psikolohiyang Filipino methods to make sure that we are still uh, gathering information uh, without us, um, you know, without us being too uh, invasive, you know, of, uh, of the, you know, of the community life, you know, when you engage them when they're already, when you are with them in their community. So I have here the methods matrix, no? Um, this methods mat matrix is very, uh, is very important because uh, this gives you an overview of how you are going to answer the objectives of your research. So that broad question that I asked um, was divided into three research objectives. So you can see here the objectives, no? And then, um, by looking at the objectives, I tried to identify what are the key variables that I am going to, end, to examine or to investigate. So it is important that you have that plan in mind that when I, these are the things that I want to look into, um, these are the very specific things that I am interested in to make sure that I'm able to meet the objective of my study. Um, but this methods matrix at the same time uh, helped me identify uh, how did I collect that information? How did I collect that data? That um, that will give me no, an answer or that will give me a better understanding of these different variables. And eventually, these different variables will answer no, the, the objectives of my, of my study. So if you are in the process of writing your thesis, um, even if it is not required by your professors or by your panel, I would strongly suggest that you come up with this methods matrix because that will help you see in one page uh, what you have done so far, what methods you have used, and if you are really able to look into those variables that you identified as important in your, in your study. So I only had two research locales. Um, one is in Subic Sambales, no, but it's in the 
uh, it's inland no it's um it's in, in the foot of the mountains of Subic Sambales and the other one is an Aitor resettlement in Botol and Sambales and then the third one is um this is not a this is a private uh private school run by uh, Franciscan sisters and this is also in Subic Sambales so there no so if some of you are from Sambales then you know where it is no it's in the it's in the northwestern part of uh, Metro Manila about uh, 200 kilometers away no? so i used to travel uh, in the evening no and then do my field work on a tuesday and wednesday and then come back wednesday night for my classes here in fp uh so there no so there's uh this there's this the one in subic which is aningway sakatihan elementary annex uh, so this is how the school look like this is the principal's office no um this is ano medyo in, in, inland talaga siya no? it's difficult to access this place uh yeah so either you take uh you take um, a motorcycle going there uh when i was there it's accessible by a 4x4 vehicle uh or the way to go is to walk to the to walk to the community um and then this one is in botolan it's farther away from uh from uh from subic no, which is the Lobunga High School. It's a resettlement school. So if you know, if you know the history of the Aita, many of them were displaced because of the Pinatubo eruption. So this is how how it looked like. Uh, and then the St. Francis Learning Center, no, is in uh, is also in Subi, no. And this is my photo with the students and and the sisters, no, uh, who uh, who are running, no. See, Sister Mafran is the sister who who started uh, this school way back in 1991. Um, after the Pinatubo eruption, because the the Aita people who were um, who were displaced requested her to educate them, no, because uh, during the at the height of the Pinatubo eruption, uh, they were being pulled, no, niloloko sila nung mga nung mga unat, no, they called the lowlanders unat, and um and because of that they wanted to learn how to read and how to write, and that's how that's the story, no, of this uh of this learning center of this school. And then I had uh, for my key informant interviews, I had uh, this um, this government officials from the Department of Education, and then I also had to talk with the representatives of the different schools, no, uh, the administrators and the teachers. And then I also have uh, key informants from other schools that catered uh, to, with uh, that also came up with their own uh, IT ed programs. And of course, I had this um, I had this. A questionnaire no, given out to the indigenous students of Atingway, Atingway Sakatihan and Loobunga High School. So these are some of the photos that I had when I did my interviews and my FGDs no, with the people that I have mentioned uh, earlier. No? And this is the profile of my respondents. So you will see that uh, many of them are in, uh, in high school. Uh, and the age bracket is uh, 14 to 15 years old. And then many of them are in um, are in grade eight, no, and uh, grade eight. Oh uh, no, it's uh, it's grade nine actually. And you see that their parents are many of them are employed, no. Um, and the kind of employment these are yung parang I would admit that this is underemployment, no, because the parents are paid a uh, very little amount of money, no, for their employment. So this is the photo of the students no, when they were answering my uh, my questionnaire. Probably you will see how different they are from the students that you are familiar with. No? So you'll see them, uh, many of them are uh, barefoot in the classroom. No? Kasi usually they, they leave their, uh, their sleepers outside of the classroom. Uh, yeah, so that's how they look like. Okay. So what are the research in instruments? So I have the key informant interview schedule, the FGD guide, and the survey uh, questionnaire which is a 27-item Likert scale um, divided into five parts uh, or rather into four parts and validated by five experts and um, through a cognitive interview. So why did I not have it pre-tested? I will answer that later. No? Uh, and why did I have to engage? Uh, why do I have to have a cognitive interview instead? So here uh, is, the, is the photo of my uh, key informant uh, interview schedule and my FGD guide. And then this is how the survey questionnaire uh, looked like. So you can see that it is uh, written in Filipino because um, because uh, I wanted to make sure you know that they will understand my uh, my questionnaire better. Uh, but here, okay. So now I will explain to you why instead of pre-testing my questionnaire, I had to engage in uh, 
I had to do a cognitive interview instead. And it is because uh, there is a very difficult process before you can get into uh, research of this kind. So first, um, the first step will have to make sure that you have to get the free and prior informed consent or the FPIC of the indigenous groups that you are that you would like to study. So, um, so what is the FPIC? So if you look at the IPRA, it says that any project that will involve uh, the indigenous peoples will always uh, have to uh, satisfy this particular requirement, which is to make sure that you inform them of what you are doing, why you want to do this research, what is the objective of your research, no? what will it cost the participants, no? the indigenous communities. And when they consent to your study, then that is the only time that you can actually do the research. But because you have a layer here, which involves the government, then that means even before you can enter the community of indigenous peoples, you have to go through the, the bureaucracy and make sure that you, um, you know, that you get the, you get first the approval of the NCIP, who will process the, uh, which will process the papers, no? So it, for me, in my case, it entails, you know, several visits, not to the regional office, no? Uh, region 3 office of the NCIP, which is based in San Fernando, uh, Pampanga. So that means I have to go back and forth, no, just to be able to process the papers. And then at the same time, um, um, after that, no, I was required not to go for a short meeting in Botol and Zambales. So the trip was actually much longer than the meeting so that I can meet with the IKSP team. So the IKSP is the Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Practices team. Uh, and so we can finalize the work and financial plan. I can tell you that it's, mm, yeah, it's, it's expensive to, to do this because, uh, of course, aside from the transportation expenses, I had to get a small room where I can stay for the night, you know, uh, because I would often, you know, I would often stay there for two or three days. So it's, it's a bit expensive. Of course, you have to compensate. Uh, you have to give them the, you have to give the government officials accompanying you with a per diem. And then uh, you have to prepare food, no? Instead of giving them tokens one by one, what I did was to prepare meals for them. So that means I have to do the marketing also in the morning and all that. So it's it's really it's really very expensive also. But once uh, you get the approval, no, of uh, of the work and financial plan, then that is your go signal to meet with the chief chieftains and get their oral consent, no? If they are if they do not know how to read and write. Uh, and then uh, if they do know how to read and write, then you can secure their written, uh, their written consent. So that is what you call the FPIC. So if you're interested in this research, then you have to get this. Okay. So here, no, this is the, you know, you have, this is the form that I have to submit and all that. No? Um, I think I have to pay 500 for the processing of my, of my papers. And this are the, some of the documents, you know, that they will release to you. They will process this. Uh, which shows that um, they already have, uh, that the government is giving you the approval to engage uh, in this kind of research. So this is my initial meeting with the elders of the community to secure their oral consent. Uh, so this is, uh, this is in Aningway, Sakatihan, and this is in, uh, uh, this is the one in Loobunga, no? which is just actually across the school. And then we did the written FPIC. No? So we ask, those who can write among the elders, we ask them to write their names and to sign. Uh, but those, the others, no, if you notice this one, the others will just put their uh, thumb mark because they don't know how to write. No? So they just uh, show their consent by using their um, thumb mark. Um, but of course, another would be Another hurdle no, that you do that you uh, that you have to do is the ethics review. So uh, when I did my dissertation, this is my dissertation. So I had to secure first the ethics review approval of my department, and then I have to submit it uh, to the research ethics office of of the university. Um, this is another major hurdle. When I did my masters also on IPs in New Zealand, they are much more strict because even before you can uh, you can start doing your field work no, or even go back to your own country, you have to get the ethics approval first of that uh, human participants ethics committee. So we are more afraid of the ethics committee than the actual defense of the paper. 
Um, and then yung, uh, the survey questionnaire naman, no, I had to consult a statistician from UP. And then I prepared a content validation template that was approved by the statistician. I had it content validated by experts. I had five experts who validated it. And then I did a cognitive interview with Dumagat students. So Dumagats are um, IPs in Bulacan. So why do I have to do a cognitive interview and not uh, not, a, uh, how, not a pretest? And it is because of the fact that if I, again, enter the, a community, then I will have to get another NCIP for that. And I don't have the luxury of time. But here, uh, since I personally know the people running this, this particular school, I just secured the consent of their guardians and I was already able to ask them to participate in this uh, cognitive interview. And that's how we validated my questionnaire. And then the statistician helped me uh, using STATA 10.1 to look into the results of the survey. So this is how the content, uh, uh, the content validation template looked like. Uh, and this is me, you know, doing the cognitive interview um, in Doña Remedios, Trinidad. So Doña Remedios is about um, 60 kilometers away from Metro Manila. So it's in the foot of uh, the Sierra Madre Mountains. No? So I had to go there just to do this uh, cognitive interview with the Dumagat. No? So these are the Dumagat students and these are their uh, teachers. Ito siya, Dumagat din siya, and he's, um, he finished school, no? in this uh, parochial mission school. Uh, yeah, so this is what you do when you do the um, interviews, no? Uh, the interviews and the FGDs, it, it's somehow easy to make the tools because you just have to be, have the big themes, you know, the questions that you want to ask. But the challenge with the FGDs and the interviews would be when you have to transcribe all the interviews and the FGDs and then code it and then organize them into themes and analyze the data and have the data validated. So the only part wherein I ask for help, no, as far as the output is concerned, is in transcribing the interviews. I asked two of our students to uh, help me transcribe the, the interviews, no, because as you can see, I did several FGDs and, and interviews. But uh, one important tool that you have to remember is that once you are done you know, with your paper, you have to go back to the communities and have the data validated. So here is when I was doing the FGD, no? As I told you, uh, instead of giving them tokens individually, I just cook, you know, I just cook meals for them. Uh, so here, no, is another uh, FGD with the elders and the barangay officials. And this is when, this is me when I already went back. I have already written my dissertation and I had to go back to them uh, to present to them that, the validated no, data. So I, I did a lot of corrections also with the names, you know, the terminologies, et cetera. So here you, you see that they're already holding no, uh, the draft of my dissertation uh, for that data validation. So uh, I think I have a bit more, uh, I think I have like five minutes. So this is uh, basically the findings of my study. So you look at the ITA learning system. Um, so, so this is the ITIL learning system, no? and these are the key findings that I had. Uh, first, we identified the ancestral domain or the community as the locus of learning. And then you have the uh, elders as your teachers. <clears throat> the method is experiential learning. And the ITSP is the content of that lifelong learning. <clears throat> and then I also had a presentation on the ITIL learning cycle. So what is the ITIL learning cycle? No, because it is experiential. So uh, the idea here is that if you have a child and you want to teach the child how to hunt, then you don't you don't give them a book, no, and you say this is how you do the hunting, but rather you take them to a hunting expedition and you let them participate in the hunting. So if they're still very young, then they just have to observe, and once they reach the right age, then they experience it, and then they try to process to reflect on it and try to see the relevance of what they are doing until finally they are able to perform perform the act uh, of, let's say, of hunting or, or fishing or planting or whatever life skill uh, they want the, the young ones to learn. No? So this is how the ITA learning cycle look like, and it is anchored on their... Uh, and it is anchored on their indigenous knowledge systems and practices, okay? 
Uh, and this is now the DepEd's Indigenous Peoples uh, Education Framework. And you will see that now there is that cultural sensitivity because the DepEd made sure that um, the IP Ed program is community-based, it's anchored on the IKSP, it's based on their worldview, uh, it uh, emphasizes their identity, cultural heritage, and self-determination, and it also focuses now on culture as a living process, culture not culture as stagnant, no, but culture culture as something that is uh, evolving. And um, the, the DepEd also made sure that uh, there is the uh, there's the tweaking, you know, the the revisions of the curriculum or the program if needed, uh, so that um, the program is always attuned to the present needs and situations of the of the IPs, no. And then they have the DepEd already designed a system of interventions needed when uh, when uh, there are revi there are revisions that already have to be made, no. So ito yung inaral ko, no, yung interface between the K-12 standards and what we refer to as the community standards because that is the process of the interface. So basically, the methods that were used by the Department of Education uh, are this. no, So it is called contextualization, localization, and indigenization to make sure that um, the curriculum that is being used uh, reflected the realities, no? the, the live realities of the indigenous uh, students. Uh, yeah, so these are the points of interface that I um, identified. Or, uh, this is also in the, uh, this is not an original uh, uh, analysis. It's actually uh, provided also by the Department of Education. These are the, uh, the cycle of life, no? which becomes the basis of uh, the indigenous knowledge systems and practices. And these are some of the materials that were already developed, which I wanted to show to you. Uh, so here, um, the Department of Education came up with the Sambal Botolan alphabet. It was important to them to have their, their own alphabet that reflected indigenous culture. So you see no, that um, the words that are being used are uh, coming from the, from, the, from the language or the dialect of the IPs. Uh, and they have illustrations that uh, the students can easily find, you know, in the immediate environment. Um, this is the spelling guide, no, uh, uh, that was already developed by the by the by the Department of Education and their partner institutions. Uh, these are some of the learning materials, the books that were developed, no. So you see that it's already stated in the in the language of the indigenous peoples. So yeah, no. So hindi natin siya naiintindihan. We don't understand them because we don't speak their language. Uh, and these are some examples of the indigenized, indigenized lesson plans. Um, and there are very, very specific illustrations. And what is interesting here is that the, the teachers um, and the Department of Education had to bring it back, you know, and consult the indigenous peoples to make sure that they agree. To this, to this representation of who they are as a people, because this is something that is going to be shared with the with the students. So, parang every step of the way, um, the the IP groups, particularly their uh, elders, are being consulted by the Department of Education, and all materials are uh, consulted to them to make sure that they are reflective of their indigenous reality. So here, no, I just have this photo because um, this is actually an important part of my research. Uh, so this is the Lubon, no? and this is the metaphor that I use uh, in describing the relationship of the Philippine state. No? Uh, so here you have the Philippine state, and here you have the Aida people. And this, is, um, and this is how I illustrated how their partnership looked like. And the objective of this would be to make sure that you develop students, no? whether they're indigenous or not indigenous, you want them to develop what we call cultural competence and prof proficiency. So this is what I mean when I use the word bicultural citizens because a bicultural citizen is not only appreciative of his or her own culture, um, he or she is not ethnocentric, but rather this person has an appreciation and has a very good uh, knowledge, no? has very good knowledge of cultures that are different from his, uh, uh, his or her own uh, culture. So this is uh, the most, uh, uh, I would say, the highlight or the most important part of my um, dissertation because 
uh, I developed this idea uh, in relation to the metaphor no, of the Lubon, you know, the photo that you saw earlier, because I wanted to see and establish, I used that met metaphor to look at the relationship of uh, the Aida peoples and the Philippine state or the Philippine government. So that's it. Um, I, I think I exceeded the time, but I hope that uh, I was able to encourage you to engage in this kind of research. Thank you very much again for your uh, for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Rita, no, for, for for sharing your research. You know, uh, it's a, it's always very enlightening for me to, to hear you and hear this kind of uh, of, of research, no, uh, especially that I personally believe na yung research no parang instrument sa saan or venue siya na pagpapag-usapan yung mga ganitong uh, bagay, no, yung mapatuloy yung diskurso sa mga para sa mga tao na na, na marginalized na mga nasa uh, ganong sector ng libro. Okay, so maraming salamat po. Thank you, sir. So, i-open po natin yung open forum natin for, for the presentation of Ma'am Rita. I think we can accommodate two or three questions before we proceed uh, to our next keynote. So, if you have any question, please feel free to type in in the chat box or you may also raise your virtual hand so that you can be uh, acknowledged. Uh, uh, sir. <laughs> well, 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 they are thinking of their question. Uh, siguro mauna na po ako mag, mag Thank you, sir. Uh, siguro ma'am sa, sa atin, uh, uh, parang research does not end the conversation. Kumbaga, it, it it would open more conversation in terms of the things that we are trying to find out. So, in terms of your or your research, ma'am, uh, ano po yung based sa mga naging findings nyo, ano po yung mga dapat pa nating continuously pag-usapan at, at gawa ng research in terms of indigenous uh, people's education? Ay, naka sir, thank you for that question. No? There's actually a lot that we can do in terms of indigenous education because you will see, uh, like, when you look at my research local, I only um, I only conducted my research in two, no? in two uh, to uh, Aita communities. But we have to uh, recognize that uh, while there are uh, commonalities no, in terms of the cultural practices of uh, indigenous peoples, there are also variations or differences. So um, the experience of the Aita people might be different uh, from, let's say, the experiences of the Mangyan in Mindoro, you know, um, the, pe you know the indigenous peoples in the Cordilleras, uh, in fact, even among the Aita community, because these are the Aitas in Sambales, and then you have the Aita, for example, in Pampanga, you have the Aita in Tarlac. Sa Aita pa lang, di ba? There's already a lot of uh, opportunities there, di ba? Uh, how much more if we try to expand and include all the other indigenous groups uh, in the Philippines? So um, the idea here is that when you engage in this kind of research, no, let's say, let, let us say, for example, that you'd say, I want to replicate the research that uh, Mamrita Mam Rita did, you know. Um, but you will see that while you can replicate the methods, you cannot really replicate the findings as well, because there are very, there are very unique situations, you know, that indigenous peoples experience, no, depending, for example, on their natural environment, you know, depending on, let's say, the political stability in their area. So for instance, yung mga Aita, relatively safe sila, di ba? The only threat that they had uh, 30 years ago was the Pinatubo eruption. And that was why they had to be relocated. But if you conduct, uh, if you replicate my study, for example, in Sierra Madre among the Dumagat, they will tell you, for example, the challenges that they're experiencing now with the mining, uh, the mining companies, although that's also a problem in Sambales, no? but let's say, uh, the mining companies that are taking advantage of the Sierra Madre region, uh, uh, and that is probably unique to the Dumaga, no? uh, who, who are based in the Sierra Madre. If you want, if you're from Mindanao and you want to study, you know, the indigenous peoples in, in Mindanao, then probably you can talk about the political uh, situation of the indigenous schools in Mindanao. No, particularly the Lumad schools and all that, diba? So in other words, there are very, very unique experiences uh, that are true only uh, to those indigenous communities that you are studying. And that actually makes this study very, very exciting, diba? Because uh, you will always discover something new 
uh, when you engage no, in this kind of research, considering how diverse also the indigenous population is in the Philippines. Yun, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ma'am Rita. No, so I, I think what, what I, I then got from, from that no, is parang, yes, you can replicate the method, no, pero because of the unique experiences, the unique context of each culture, yes. of these indigenous people, ma'am ma surprise ka rin talaga dun sa mga sa mga makukuha mong findings. Yes. Uh, they're, they're not re really uh, uh, similar. And, and having this many kind of, having this uh, research no, ng iba't ibang indigenous people, no, although magkakaiba, maaaring mm -hmm. siya yung maging point of reflection natin talaga na, na paano ba natin gagawin yung curriculum natin, yung education natin, na, na mag would really uh, encourage social justice in terms of accessibility, in yes. terms of representation sa mga, mm -hmm. sa mga tao. So thank you for, for that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from Ruel Anikas, sabi niya po sa chat box. Congratulations, Dr. Rita, for having conducting your research among select uh, AITA communities in Zambales. My question is, how many weeks or months you have conducted your study? Have you stayed in the community and applied community uh, immersion? You mentioned a while ago, ma'am, that it's a 27-year uh, yes. <laughs> journey on, on this research. Uh -oh. yeah. In terms the, of the, uh, yeah, it's a 27-year journey because, um, you know, like, I don't want them to, I, I don't want to look at IPs, you know, as uh, parang just a, a subject, no? parang, you know, parang subject that you just have to study them. No? I want to look at them and see them as, as humans. No? I want to, I, I relate with them as humans. I re relate with them as peoples. I consider them my friends and family, no? And that 27 journey is that's that's actually what it is about, no? But if we if I want to uh look into the actual, you know, the actual uh, <laughs> conduct of this the study that I am presenting to you, then it ran for a span of um over over a year. Uh because uh of course, well, of course you have to fulfill the academic requirements, right? And uh, I had to present my proposal and then kasi I had that but I will just share it anyway, no. So I had a lag between the proposal and the actual writing of the dissertation. So when the time that uh uh when when I started uh working back no, or looking at my research, you know, I was sort of asked to to change again some parts of the study. So parang it was really actually very discouraging, no, but I had to do it because it's an academic requirement, no. But um, so what I did, no, was to again get the uh, NCIP clearance, no, the FPIC. But I had to stay outside of the community because I also didn't have the luxury of time. So when I was doing the actual field work that ran for for about four months, uh, I had to uh, travel to and fro Manila to Sambales. So I had classes here in FEU. Uh, I, I made sure that I had classes only on Mondays and Thursdays. And then I will leave Monday evening. No, I'll take the, the 7 p.m. bus uh, from Cubao. And then I will arrive in Botolan around 12 midnight. And then in the morning of Tuesday and uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, I will conduct my, my interviews, my data gathering and all that. And then um, I leave uh, Wednesday afternoon so that I can be in campus uh, Thursday, <laughs> Thursday, Thursday morning, no? because that's my class. And I don't want to miss my, my class as well here in FE. So that was how it was for about three to four, three to four months. No? And Siguro, I would like to add that uh, you should allot um, a significant amount of time for the government to process your uh, FPIC clearance. Because uh, you know how it is in government. Even if they want to help you, um, there's just a, there's just a lot of things that they have that the government has to do, and therefore um, you have to allot a significant amount of time. Because I had to wait for one month to think that one of my external panel who helped me out is already part of the NCIP. So, kumbaga meron ka ng kakilala, alam mo naman ang kultura sa atin, di ba? I already know somebody from the inside, and yet um, it all, it took me one month, no, just to process that FPIC. And so I would like to advise our students one thing, no, um, always expect that things will take longer than expected. You cannot cram, 
you know you cannot cram research of this kind no uh i also recall no some of the challenges that i encountered because you know i sort of i was uh, pressed for time i had to do my field work during the habagat season no yung tagulan diba so august september october and um i had to change my community because by the time that i started data gathering the rivers are already flooded and i cannot cross you know the and i cannot go to the community anymore so alam mo yun yung parang you become very vulnerable to the external uh, you know to the external uh, forces no parang you feel helpless i have to change uh, one of the communities that i wanted to that i wanted sana to participate in my study uh, during the initial uh, when i was doing my initial field work with the dumagat in bulacan um, I, I had to go through that, you know. Uh, I went there on a, you know, in on, on October, and then um, again, it's it's a bagat season, and there's no bridge, and I wanted so badly to cross to the other side of the river, so I had to ride a balsa, no, tapos may rope, no, and then I just had to pull, you know. I, of course, there are other people with me, but we had to pull the rope to be able to cross to the other side because there's no bridge from which we can cross. So ginabi na kami ng ginabi, kakaintay no, for, the, for the flood to subside and all that. But it's something that I needed to do, you know, to be able to engage in this kind of research. So you also have to be physically fit, no? I'm not saying that I am physically fit, but that is also one of the challenges that you will encounter. You know? Like this trip that I had in, in, uh, in uh, Sierra Madre, it was a four-hour walk you know, from that river up the up the mountains and madali pa yon diba madali pa yon uh for others it is half a day you know uh, uh half a half a day walk to the to the community but you know what if you're young and you are energetic it's actually a very exciting kind of work to to engage in no because it's a you know it's it's a diff, it's very different from from what from what we usually do no when we do educational research right so that is how I, I I hope that I'm answering the question, no? but that is actually how long it was, no? So it's about four months for the actual data gathering, and I did not stay in the community mainly because I also did not want to, you know, to be a problem or to pose uh, inconveniences to the to the community. So I had to I had to get a small a very small room, you know, in uh in Sambales, no, through the assistance of the NCIP in Botolan. And that's where I, I would stay for the for the night or for those nights that I had to be in the community. So I had to travel you know, uh, to and from Manila. Thank yes. you, ma'am. I think you have answered the, the question. <laughs> yes, sir. Pero, oh, sorry, uh, Angel Dal. Since you mentioned, ma'am, no, yung rigor ng paggawa ng research na to, no, it's safe to assume at, to everyone, ma'am, that this is really your advocacy now as, oh, yeah. as a professional mm -hmm. at IP research for you is not just a, a, a requirement in, in your class, but rather an advocacy na, na meron. Mm, yes, sir. Well, we have been talking about this. Now, it is really an advocacy kasi uh, it can be, you know, the conditions can be very discouraging, di ba? If, uh, if, you don't, if you don't like what you're doing, right? So, ako, I experience it, yung mga nagagalusan, no? Yung ganon. But that's how it is, diba? And I, I chose this particular kind of uh, research. And that is the reason why you really have to love what you are doing. Because um, if, you are, if you love what you are doing, no, the research topic that you're interested in is something that you feel very strongly about as well. Then you eliminate also the burden of looking at it as just a requirement that you need to, to comply with. So I think that is uh, the reason also why I'm still in this kind of research even after uh, 27 years no? that started when I was a college student myself. Yes, sir. So I hope our, our teacher education students no, take, take that reminder. No? Don't, don't look at research as a requirement. No? Even, in, even in the workplace, because we have requirement for research in the workplace, don't look at it as a requirement, but rather find your, your advocacy. Talaga, no? Ano ba yung interest at gusto mong gawin para sa professional para makasunod. Yung significance the, nga. The significance, yes. We have one last question or reaction. This would be coming from our second keynote speaker, uh, Ma'am 
uh, Maria Luna have, School. Yeah. Right, Ma'am Palu. Hi, Ma'am. It's good to Hi. meet you. Hello. We have not met yet. <laughs> good morning. Good yes. morning. Thank you so much, Joseph. And nice to meet you also, Doc Rita, yeah. even virtually. <laughs> yes, Doc Malu. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your um, your dissertation. It's really a mind... Um, well, I, I was I was very much impressed on the manner by which the, the research was was conducted. Thank um, you. And indigenous education is also close to my heart. Um, having had that opportunity to do um service learning also for um a community in uh an Aita community also in in Sapang uh, Target. Ah, Sapang okay. Target. Yes, I was okay. able. To, wow, that's good yeah, to know. An immersion <laughs> program also for uh, mm -hmm. with their group, and I'm I'm very much interested to know because. Um, we we all know that indigenous education is already part and parcel of the uh, of the uh, direction of the Department of Education, and I would like to know, Doc Rita, um, how do you think will this impact um, the curriculum, especially in basic ed? Because um, as as you know, uh, we're really promoting um, cultural respect, no, and mm -hmm. of course, there's still so much to be desired mm -hmm. uh, when we speak of um, um, acceptance. Um, and then at, at the same time, um, really ensuring that our indigenous peoples are also part mm -hmm. and parcel, um, not mm -hmm. only of education, but of, of our entire um, of our entire culture. No? So I'm mm -hmm. just interested to, to know that. Po. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Doc Malu. Yes, it's good to meet you virtually. And I hope to get to meet you no, face to face soon. Um, well, first of all, um, this is... We are, I have to admit that the Department of, of Education is already behind, you know, uh, in coming up with the IP ed because this is something that's already being done in many settler societies. Um, but it's a good, you know, it's a good step, you know, uh, and, and it's a very important step that was taken by the Department of Education. And as far as I know, what they're doing now is that the IP ed is being conducted only in those uh, public schools that have a significant population of indigenous groups. So for example, in Sambales, uh, of course in Mindoro, you know, and in the Cordi and all that. Um, and it's because the assumption is that we have to train th that those students in the immediate environment to develop that kind of so, uh, cultural uh, competence and cultural sensitivity. But of course, my dream, you know, and I hope, and I think that the, the Department of Education is also in that trajectory, is that, um, Eventually, we want this to be fully integrated into the curriculum of uh, of basic school of basic education, uh, regardless of where they are in the Philippines. Because at the end of the day, this is going to be a stepping stone for all citizens, now whether they relate with IPs or not, to develop that kind of cultural um, sensitivity. Um, and um, one of the things I think that was uh, brought up now in the course of my discussion with uh, DepEd officials is also the need to re-engineer in a way to, to a certain extent our teachers' education uh, institutions because uh, at this time uh, there's there are no teachers specializing in IP education, right? So diba, diba we have, uh, for example, we have SPED, for instance, diba, in, in our schools for teachers, but there's none yet that specializes on IP IP ed. And that is very important if we really want IP ed to be really part of the mainstream curriculum. But as an advocate, of course, my dream would be that um, we will eventually allow indigenous peoples you know, to support indigenous peoples to put up their own schools. You know, the, the LUMAD model is actually um, is actually very good. Kaya lang na politicized kasi siya. Eh. So that becomes now the problem, di ba? Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about the LUMAD schools, you know, but that is actually uh, the better way of doing things, that you let, uh, you let the you let the indigenous peoples um, put up their own schools, you know, provide them with the resources, uh, get their, their mentors to be the teachers, you know, so that they're still very much in touch with their, with their culture. Because if you look at education from the indigenous worldview, um, it, is, uh, it, is, it is actually the elder or the men, uh, it is the elder of the community that is the repository of all the indigenous knowledge systems and practices. And for that to be effectively uh, uh, transmitted to the younger generation, then you have to get the teachers, you have to get the elders to be the teachers in their schools. Um, the, the experience of the, Mangyan, uh, no, the, the Maori people in New Zealand is very, very inspiring because, you know, when they recognize that, you know, there's a dwindling number of young Maori uh, students who can speak the Maori language. So at the time, in the 1980s, 
um, the Maori language was a dying language, no, to the point of extinction. And so the Maori people decided, you know, to, to get, you know, to, to do something about it. No? And they knew that the state will be very slow in addressing that need. And so what they did is to put up schools in their garage, you know, and have the old, you know, the, the, old, the, the old Maori handle the preschool children uh, and teach the language, you know, teach the culture, etc. And when these preschool kids move to elementary, then they put up their own elementary school. And then when they move to college and to the university, and now you have Maori University that validated the Maori knowledge systems and practices. And of course, you know, as an advocate, that is also my dream, you know, that uh, we don't politicize education too much by, you know, by allowing this, you know, allowing our indigenous uh, peoples to put up their own schools as well. So while we are teaching them what they should know about, uh, about mainstream society, they are learning it from their vantage point as indigenous peoples. So those are the two things no, that I think. So one is to, um, to ensure that the curriculum, wherever it is in the Philippines, no, the basic ed, you know, um, we just don't uh, use the IP ed for those areas where you have indigenous populations, but make sure that everybody gets to, you know, gets to learn about indigenous culture. And knowledge systems, and teach your teach the teachers, okay, how to handle um, indigenous people's education. So that's my answer, uh, Doc Malu. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. It's it's a very good question. Thank you, Doc Rita. Totally enlightening. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mama Malu, and thank you for that interaction between Mama Malu and Mama Rita. Uh, you're right, Mama Rita. It's uh, Mama Malu and Mama Rita. It's very enlightening to you all of this. So at this point, I would like to thank you, Marita, for, you, for, for this opportunity and for this uh, sharing you, you, you gave us. No, it's, I hope no, through, through this kind of platform and discourse, no, yung mga nakikinig sa atin, uh, maging instrumento rin ng pagpapatuloy ng diskurso ng ganitong klaseng mga, mga topic. Kailangan natin ito. No? Sabi nga ni Marita, medyo may scarcity sa mga, sa mga topics na to, no And kailangan hindi siya matapos. No? Hindi siya matapos sa isang research, dapat magpatuloy siya. And by continuing to talk about it, no? we, we, we are we're doing our part as educators na, na magkaroon ng transformative na, na, na education no? para sa mga uh, indigenous people. So, thank you so much, thank uh, Marita. Thank you. Maraming maraming. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you po. Uh, so before we proceed with our uh, second keynote, let's just pause for a 13 seconds uh, break. Uh, we will just run a short uh, video so that we can we can reset our attention in the forum.
welcome back to our uh, Semestral Education Research Forum. We are done already with our first keynote speaker and we will proceed now with our second keynote presentation. Our second keynote speaker is Dr. Maria Lourdes Pesneri Gura. Mamalu has been in the teaching profession for more than two decades now. She was a full-time instructor in UP Asian Institute of Tourism from 1997 to 2003 and a part-time history teacher in her alma mater, St. Escolastica's College, since 1998. She joined her alma mater as a full-time teacher in 2003, was the social studies coordinator in 2008, and was the assistant principal of the high school unit from 2011 to 2014. A self-taught history teacher, she emphasized on a didactic approach in teaching, this discipline, so learners are illuminated on the lessons of the past. At present, she is the acting division chief of academic affairs, curriculum and instruction services division of the National Academy of Sports and the director of the Center of Teaching and Learning in FE Manila. Prior to this engagement, she was the principal of a Catholic international school, Everest Academy Manila, her training in school administration and curriculum instruction, a bet in performing her responsibilities, is her focus on curricular innovations and programs. She has written uh, classroom-based research in the areas of curriculum and evaluation, digital technology in instruction, teaching perspectives and teaching practices. She has written modules on peace education and Philippine history and voters education for the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. Her qualitative research on using philosophical lenses in curriculum, theorizing as part of her doctorate dissertation were published in Scopus and ASEAN Index Journal. Uh, guests and students to talk about sports education in the Philippines, let us all welcome Ma'am Maria Lourdes S. Neriko. Again, Ma'am, good morning. Hello, Joseph. Thank you so much. Um, and good morning to all of you. Just allow me to share my screen. Can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Ma all right. Okay. Uh, so again, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me in our uh, semestral turf. Uh, I know that most of uh, most of our students, no. Uh, when they hear the word um, research, most of them really get intimidated. Uh, but I hope that after our encounter this morning, you may look at it from a different lens. Uh, Doc Rita made mention earlier about advocacy. Um, and I hope that in the next 20 or 30 minutes of this um, keynote um, uh, speech, I will be able to share with you um, topics that are very close to my heart. And specifically, this are sports, education, and research. Uh, I'm quite certain that the pictures on screen um, are very familiar to all of us uh, because the recently concluded Tokyo Olympics had a tremendous impact on the interests of all stakeholders in sports. Um, and, you, and who wouldn't, no? Um, the pride that these athletes, together with the other athletes who competed, um, brought to our country and putting um, the Philippines on the history books of the Olympics cannot be undermined. So let us begin our conversation this morning um, by asking you to do some movement. So can I um, just ask everyone if it's possible to turn on their cameras even for a few seconds um, or a maximum of a minute? Um, just so us, we can engage also um, the others to take part in our conversation this morning. Uh, this topic is about sports education in the Philippines. And of course, when we speak of sports education, the first thing that comes to mind will be movement. So just very, very quickly, you know, I just would like to have a, um, a very uh, quick survey. Um, so I would ask you to stand if the statements that I will be saying um, re uh, are related to you. Or you had this, this experience, okay? So just six questions, now six statements only. Not really a question, but more of a statement. So number one, um, please stand or raise your hand or if you want to kick your leg, that's totally fine. Um, if you look forward to PE classes, okay? So stand for those who look forward to PE classes um, or raise your hand or again, kick your leg. Um, I think most of our students or participants um, remain seated. So I don't think they look forward to PE classes, but there's still a, a big number, no? Um, okay, so number two, 
uh, it was in PE that I learned my skills in a certain sport. Okay, it was in PE that I learned my skills in a certain um, sport. So I see Mom Vida raising her hand. Thank you so much. Okay, and I'm sure there's still others. Um, Ali is also raising uh, her hand. Uh, Mark is also raising her hand, uh, his hand. Thank you so much. Okay, third, third statement. I do not like PE because it makes me perspire. Okay. I do not like PE because it makes me... Joseph, I, I, I saw that. <laughs> so, ayaw ni Joseph ng PE kasi pinagpapawisan siya. Okay? Alright, fourth statement. I love sports. Okay, so can, again, wow, it's very good to see a lot of people standing up, raising their hand also that they love sports. Okay, fifth statement. I am indifferent about sports. Okay, all right, that's good. Very few. <laughs> and the last statement, I see a career in sport. Oh, wow, I also see a show fancy. Well, very good, very good. So thank you. Thank you for, for participating. And you know what? There was a girl who said yes to numbers one, two, four, and six. So she extremely loved PE classes and looked forward when the module is on sports. And it was in PE that she learned the skills of volleyball starting at grade two. And the rest, you may say, is history. So for this girl, volleyball is life. And that little girl is me. I have this great love affair with volleyball that spans decades of playing. Uh, but I had to wait um, to be in high school to join the varsity team because there were still no teams yet during my elementary days. And so I thought that the love for sport would end when I graduated high school. But that love affair continued when I joined the UP Women's Volleyball Varsity playing for four seasons in the UAAP in college. And I thought, again, it would end there. But lo and behold, even when I started working back in 1998, um, some of you may not have been born yet during that time. Um, and even up to now, um, the love for the sports is really there. So I guess even if not for the pandemic, I'm certain I will still be spending my weekends playing and joining one-day leagues. No? Um, sports did not only teach me the skills, but it really formed me to be the educator I am today. Uh, believe it or not, it instilled in me the level and type of discipline that allowed me to thrive, uh, maybe in court or in the classroom or even beyond it. Uh, and this discipline also provided me the opportunity to work with former national team players who are also educators and coaches in the National Academy of Sports and in my capacity as acting head of academic, academic affairs in the National Academy of Sports, I am really able to see sports education from a, from a different perspective, um, definitely with clearer, clearer lens. Uh, sports education is not just about athletes training and performance. It is not just about the different initiatives of the different levels of the government to promote sports. Uh, but more so, it is an institutionalized system of how sports academies operate towards student, success, um, student athlete success. And when we speak of student athlete success, we are referring to the holistic development of the student athlete. So we are looking into their intellectual or cognitive development. We're also looking into values and character development. I'm sure every time you see or watch any sports game, um, the first thing that uh, that may irritate you or annoy you is that if it's a, a player is is very um is very boastful or there's a coach that that would um, just lose his or her temper. We wouldn't want that because it is also in sports education that we are developing the values and, and the character of our athletes. And of course, their sports skills. So through sports education, we, look, we also look at talent identification from grassroots programs and train them to be the world-class athletes at the same time cognizant of other potential career, um, career tracks. Because um, as we all know, um, when we speak of, of sports or just being an athlete, um, we have to make sure that we also um, have a, a, um, a fallback. 
um, especially when it, uh, when our student athletes may unfortunately experience um, some physical limitations or some of them may, might get injured, we look at sports education as a holistic development of the human person. So what, uh, so what we will be exploring um, this morning are the various sports initiatives in our country and abroad. Um, and of course, we will uh, focus on the value of research in these endeavors and definitely futures thinking. So what do we uh, mean when we speak of future, futures thinking? No? Uh, we would like to explore how our research can contribute to the emerging landscape of sports education, especially here in our country. Um, when sports education, it's still at the... Um, I. I I would like um, to say it is still at the inception stage as far as research is concerned, okay? So you might ask this question, where are we in terms of these initiatives, no? Um, so definitely there are several initiatives that are um, existing in our country uh, when, when, uh, as far as sports education is concerned. So um, this is actually complemented by the initiatives of the private sector, such as Inspire Academy, if you have heard of it, which is part of the National University School System. And also there are initiatives from what we call the local government unit, such as that of the latest sports academy. Um, and there are also um, seven republic acts or local laws enabling the support um, of uh, establishing the sports academies in the Philippines, uh, which are all intended for sports development and training. Uh, but until recently, our Republic Act 11470 was signed last um, June 9, 2020, uh, mandating the National Academy of Sports to implement a quality and enhanced secondary education program integrated with a special curriculum in sports. Um, Doc Rita made mention earlier of some um, another endeavor that may be um, explored by the government no, is in terms of um, ensuring that there are also IP, uh, IP schools. Um, and I think as far as sports education is concerned, um, this Republic Act is actually a breakthrough um, as far as sports education is uh, is concerned because these endeavors definitely are concrete manifestations of ensuring that our state gives priority to education, um, not to mention science and technology. We're also talking of arts, culture, and sports, but definitely to foster patriotism and nationalism, no? And not just uh, these core values, but also to accelerate social progress and to promote um, the total human liberation and development as reflected in Section 17 under Article 2 of our Philippine Constitution. So how important are these sports education in initiatives? These are definitely fertile grounds for research. Okay, again, not to not to be intimidated by the term research because research definitely has several layers, and we will be exploring these layers um, later on. So specifically, there could be various studies that may be um, conducted to investigate uh, our existing sports academies or sports schools in our country, um, knowing the current state. Okay, and aside from the current state, um, another um, theme for research could be what are the possible targets or what are the targets for development of these sports schools or these sports academies. Uh, definitely all of these findings uh, can help provide insights for future directions um, to strengthen um, our existing uh, institutions as uh, more specifically the National Academy of Sports. And definitely research can also assist, um, assist in policy formulation and in the design of courses or even this entire curriculum, of course, cognizant of the mandate and the direction of these academies and programs. Uh, because uh, the existing academies that we have or the sports programs that we have, um, they are very much um, focused uh, in different areas, depending on the needs also of the grassroots program or the population. Uh, but looking at, uh, looking at researches abroad, uh, definitely, there has been a broad range of topics related to sports schools um, and academies. And an interesting topic that uh, you might want to explore is actually the rising popularity of sports academies, uh, spe uh, specifically in Dubai, um, in the United Kingdom, and of course, in the United States. No? So an interesting study that I would like to share with you was one that was conducted by Leong and Shorni um, last year in 2020. They presented a very clear difference between physical literacy and physical activities, um, which we all know are part and parcel of what is intended to be covered in the uh, physical education curricula. 
When we speak of physical literacy, we are referring to the ability of the person to move with, confi uh, with confidence and competence, no? given a variety of physical activities and in multiple environments. So just imagine um, a student uh, having that competence and also that confidence to be able to perform different physical activities regardless of the environment that he or she may be in. Uh, but when we speak of physical activity, we are referring um, to the enhancement of the health and well-being of children, primarily um, to help in the prevention of obesity. So when we speak of uh, physical activity, we're not just talking about student athletes here, because even for us um, adults, uh, when we speak of physical activity, uh, it has something to do, or it is definitely related to our to uh, having an active lifestyle. But because there's a gap in what students need in PE and what is delivered, hence the sports academies are established to address this gap. So interestingly, there are several um, sports academies um, abroad that have been established to become centers of excellence to, to develop future elite athletes. And still, there are also um, other sports academies that have been created through a grassroots effort to meet the needs of the local population or school. Uh, I'm, serious, I'm quite certain that um, even in your places, no, you, you may have seen um, efforts of the local government units or even uh, private institutions to address the, uh, the needs of the local population. Um, there are also foreign studies on sports education that has parental involvement as a theme. Um, you know, there are very interesting uh, researches done abroad. No? And one, uh, one study that I would like to share with you um, is a study entitled Understanding the Increase. Um, take note of that word, the increase in parents' involvement in organized youth sports. Um, and this study was conducted in, 20, in 2018. Uh, this study uh, suggests that across social classes, parents see involvement in sports as normal. And it is also a way to connect um, to the child emotionally and to further the child's development. The significance of sports in the parent-child relationship as related both to the normalization of youth sports that the parents experienced when they, when they grew up and to the new cultural ideas of parenthood as they encounter as adults. Uh, going back to my experience um, uh, as an athlete, no? um, the involvement of my parents when I was playing is very much different as to how I involved myself uh, in the sports endeavor of um, the sports endeavor of my son. Um, and I think at one point, this has really helped me cultivate uh, the kind of relationship or a deeper relationship with my son as far as um, social emotional um, attachment um, or relationship is concerned. Uh, although this research also yielded tensions embedded in this new form of parenthood that is particularly evident in what we call deep involvement, which is an intensified form of parental engagement with youth sports that is practiced primarily by fathers in the economic fraction of the middle class. So just imagine, even if you are conducting sports education um, researches, there would also be an integration um, of social uh, of social issues, um, talking about uh, social classes, uh, talking about financial literacy as well, which we will be um, exploring also later on. Because of course, when we speak of sports education, um, there would be investment when it comes to sports. No? Um, and going back to that study, an interesting finding is that the new role of sports in the practice of parenthood is both a social class and also a generational generational phenomenon. Okay, a very interesting um, results no, um, yielded from that, uh, from that study. And parental involvement can also be seen um, dominant when you speak of athlete families. No? I'm sure that uh, for maybe for some of you, um, sports is also a way of life in your family. And in literature or in research, there's also what you call the athlete's families. And these families are um, described um, as those family systems that dedicate a significant amount of family, of family money, um, their investment, their time, and emotional energies to youth sport activities. You know what? Athlete families also include the intensive participation of parents or adult children in youth, in collegiate, or even in professional sports. So um, I am sure that um, you would also see no, um, a lot of, uh, you may have encountered or you know some 
um, family, uh, athlete families no, that may be um, quite close to you. Now, these researchers have pictured the two ends of the parental involvement in sports spectrum, where one end really do demonstrate a respect and appropriate behavior at games, and even parents' ability to function as supporters, rather than an official coaches or to its extreme um, unfortunately, the other part of that spectrum or the other end of that polarity is that it may have caused athletes burnout and consequently leading to withdrawing from sports um, academy. Okay, And other related um, topics in sports education include health services, um, which are very, uh, it's a very critical topic to ensure the overall well-being of our student athletes, whether they are in amateur or pro leagues or even the national team. Because um, just imagine if the health services will not be studied, it will be quite impossible to really support the well-being of our student athletes no? and consequently our national athletes at that. Um, a master's thesis in Finland showed that even though there's a clear need for healthcare services targeted for young athletes, the sport academy healthcare services are not currently used to a large extent. Um, and also the service procedures um, and the level of integration with athletes, um, daily training are um, do not meet yet the target, uh, the targets set for the sports academy healthcare um, services. So um, despite the uniform um, guidelines formed by the Finnish Olympic Committee, there are remarkable practical level differences in organizational structures and service prices between different academies. Uh, because maybe for, for other schools, the sports academies are also a, uh, an income generating academies, or for some, it may also be uh, totally su uh, supported um, and endorsed by the government. So the practical level differences however, seem not to have affected the perceived satisfaction of the services, whether it is um, government, um, funded or private, uh, privately funded. So, based on this, uh, on the findings, suggestions for development in the ser in the services were given, including equalizing uh, price levels between different academies and improvements in information procedures. Uh, local studies, however, on sports education remain scant uh, because most of the studies that we have are more sports education related. Okay, uh, but not necessarily on the macro level of sports education. And, and these sports education related, um, more often than not, uh, are related to the impacts of, um, of PE and sports to academic uh, achievement, um, such as a study entitled Academic Achievement as Influenced by Sports Participation in Selected Universities in the Philippines. There are also other topics that may include um, athletes and coaches burnout. Uh, we know that this is a common pheno uh, phenomenon as well. Um, and then there are also researches on what we call the sports um, program implementation, uh, which are quite also popular in local researches, such as the implementation of special sports program in public secondary school. And this is very um, crucial for us because uh, as we all know, any any program, no, uh, more often than not, between three to five years, so you should really be um, uh, evaluating its progress um, to ensure that the targets are really being met. And it is only through the research um, where uh, innovations or changes can be made. Um, but if we were to access researches in sports education, just like what I made I made mention, no, as an institutionalized system of student athlete development it may be quite challenging to find them. But we hope that this direction would change um, as in our country, the first and only sports school mandated by the law to implement a quality and enhanced secondary education program uh, integrated with special curriculum in sports um, is now open. Uh, and, and it opened its doors to 64 pioneer student athletes on full scholarship uh, by the government on eight focal sports. So the 64 um, student athletes undergo regular classes. Um, and now, right now, they're on online modality. Um, they also have in, uh, in their schedule or in their program, the strength and conditioning and sports-specific training in the chosen sport. So um, the, the National Academy of Sports now has um, eight focus sports. And the student athletes can choose between athletics, aquatics, uh, badminton, gymnastics, judo, table tennis, taekwondo, and weightlifting. So the pictures that you see here on the screen are the world-class facilities in New Clark City, uh, where the SEA Games were held. And this is where our student athletes will be training once the face-to-face -face training is already allowed uh, because these students are still in grade seven right now. 
Uh, but prior to its opening, uh, prior to its opening, uh, there were already uh, virtual benchmarking efforts of the National Academy of Sports. Uh, together with ASPAR um, Academy, Singapore Sports Academy. There's also the South uh, Australian Sports Institute and the Captiva Sports. Um, and right now, the, uh, the benchmarking uh, endeavors remain, but it is not only intended to learn the best practices for world-renowned, uh, the best practices of world-renowned sports academies, no? but it also abets in formalizing its curriculum framework and to establish collaboration in research endeavors. You know, having be, been exposed as a teacher and as a school administrator in private and international schools, what I learned in stark comparison is the curriculum framework of the National Academy of Sports. Um, the NAS student athletes are envisioned to be world-class Filipino athletes. Um, similarly, they're also envisioned to be holistically, uh, holistically developed graduates capable to proceed to any of the various curriculum exits identified by the Department of Education. May it be in higher education, may it be in employment, may it be in entrepreneurship, or even when we speak of middle-level um, skills development related to sports. And definitely consistent with the spiral progression of subjects and year-level year competency standards um, set by our Department of Education, the NAS curriculum is enhanced with the integration of sports-related knowledge and skills that makes learning more relevant and responsive to, to their daily life as a student athletes. Um, the curriculum is contextualized to suit the diverse learning needs and to cover the broad dimensions of sports, such as sports participation, sports performance, and the psychosocial aspects of sports. And as learning and, um, and sports training are at the core of the operations of the National Academy of Sports, it started to build also its research agenda with the intent of all layers of sports education part of the core operations of this academy because it intends to build a culture of evidence-based decision making in all of its curricular and sports and sports training um, aspects that will consequently affect the performance of the student athletes. Definitely research findings will be the driving force of its innovation. And I'm sure that most of you um, had this question as well, no? because given the online modality of learning, many question the execution of what we call the performance-based learning areas. And specifically, we speak of the MAPE learning area. We're talking of music, of arts, of P and Yacht, and more importantly, no, sports programs. So it is for this reason that the first research initiative um, of the National Academy of Sports is on the perceived learning and satisfaction on online PE and strength and conditioning among Filipino youth athletes. Um, this research endeavor is yet to start um, this November, um, and hopefully by the first quarter of our um, of the school year of next year, we'll be able to gather already the initial uh, the initial results. Um, as an initial research endeavor, the uh, two prong research will be conducted. One will be qualitative, wherein we will be having focus group discussions with a select group of our student athletes. And the other one will be quantitative, uh, which will um, focus more on using the structural equation model. And we expect, of course, that its resource will guide any modification in the existing strategies that are currently being used in the classroom and also in, in their training. And it is also, the National Academy of Sports is also exploring regional collaboration um, on talent identification, the grassroots programs, and athlete sustained perf uh, performances. You know what, it was very interesting um, to, um, to know that when we had that um, initial discussion uh, with a university, um, a university in, in Taiwan, uh, you know, one of the key things that they have been doing is that um, they're really um, tracking the performance of athletes and even preparing them already um, in two Olympic cycles as early as now. Uh, and they have been successful in this, in this type of model. And, and these are really the best practices, practices that we would like to see and how we can contextualize it in the Philippine setting. Um, but beyond NAS, definitely there's still so much to be explored as far as sports uh, education research is concerned. So I'm trying, try, I'm just trying to um, to throw some um, some recommendations to our um, students uh, here right now who are uh, into sports um, science and for those who may have their advocacies focused on sports education in the Philippines. 
Um, one is the anthropometric measurements of our national athletes for baseline profile, because we all know that it is uh, this will be useful in ensuring that the profile of our athletes is suited to the demands of their sport. So just imagine, no, um, there has been a question. There has been a question whether. Um, if leaders are born or created. And the same question holds true to our athletes. Are athletes born or are athletes also created and trained? Um, and one of the, uh, one of the um, studies that I have learned um, is that um, definitely there's an innate um, skill uh, that is given to all of us. But definitely that skill needs to be developed. And maybe for some of us, you might be wondering, how come we are only winning in, in boxing? We're all um, winning in, let's say, for example, weightlifting, etc. And we cannot compete, let's say, for example, um, with the with a Kenyan um, or our South African um, counterparts as far as, let's say, um, triathlon or long distance running is concerned. Um, it's because it has something to do with our, with our anatomy. Um, as Asians and specifically as Filipinos because our build um, is just really intended for specific sports and definitely this type of research would help to really um, build the kind of baseline information that we need for our for our athletes. Uh, we also need to expedite researches on the use of advanced statistical um, or measurement techniques to predict um, academic scores and sports performances during competitions. As we all know, we are not only um, creating student athletes, but we want to make sure, or not um, not just forming um, Olympic um, athletes, no, we want to make sure that there's really a balance and there's a holistic um, development of our of our students. Because just imagine if they would be competing outside and they would be representing the Philippines. Definitely when they uh, when they speak with the other counterparts, it is imperative also that they have those communication skills. Um, and this statistical and measurement techniques would also help us if the student athletes also has the capacity um, towards academic success and at the same time, um, sports success. Okay, And we are also looking um, at um, researches that would investigate the teaching and coaching styles and athlete satisfaction to enhance um, the coach-athlete relationship because that's really very important. Um, just imagine we have um, several uh, national athletes who are also um, coached and trained by foreign uh, foreign coaches. So it's really important for us um, to see what sets them apart from also our local coaches and why do our student, uh, our athletes also choose to have foreign coaches. Um, this definitely would be an interesting um research um, to explore and to ponder on. And of course, looking at the satisfaction level of our student athletes on online learning and competition will certainly augment the wealth of local sports education research, especially because of the emerging education landscape. So I, I think um, in the past um, 20 or 25 minutes or so, uh, I, was able to, uh, I was able to harp already how important um, research is because it is a powerful tool when we speak of future thinking in sports education. Because this initial um, research is together with a strong collaboration between the sports academies and the National Sports Association may influence a unified sports research agenda. So just imagine if all the sports academies, all the initiatives of the local government units, um, even the private sector will only have a unified research agenda. And we help um, in terms of um, sharing the results of our researches. Definitely the output of one um, sports academy could be an input to the national sports um, associations that could help them um, in the operations of, um, of their own um, sports associations. Um, and definitely when we consolidate the sports initiative from all levels, we hope to yield a centralized sports education framework. So just imagine our country also having a sports education framework. It will have a tremendous impact to research theory and practice. Um, at this point, it is just really a matter of identifying the trends and issues and problems in sports education that will lead to a plethora of topics to be studied. So when we speak of sports education um, research, you always have to begin with what are the trends that are that are that you see um, happening in the local in the local scene in the international scene because it is because of these trends that you will be able to identify issues. Um, issues meaning that there are debatable concerns about the certain trend. Um, some, um, if you speak, let's say, for example, of a coaching style, definitely there would be um, arguments when it comes to um, do you um, do you do a very strict style 
or an uh, authoritative style of coaching? Or do you do a participative style of coaching, which is also related to leadership? And definitely you have another layer there that you can also explore in sports education um, research as far as leadership is concerned. And of course, when you have these issues, definitely problems will arise. And it is the problem that you would like to explore further. Uh, because personally, I think it is about time that sports education is viewed beyond the lens of the physical education subject. It must be considered as an integral part of our, uh, of our education landscape to raise the standards of Philippine sports. Um, so I hope in the past 30 minutes, I was able to, um, to capture your interest in sports, in, um, in sports and not just in sports, of course, in sports education and consequently in research. So thank you so very much uh, for this morning. And um, I hope to, to read uh, and participate also in some of your researches uh, in sports education. So thank you again and good morning to everyone. Thank you, Sir Joseph. Thank you so much, Ma'am Rita. This is a fresh idea for me because it's the first time that I heard all of these things about, about sports and sports education. And so uh, we are now opening our floor for the open forum. Uh, it's 10.03. Maybe we can accommodate one or two questions from our uh, students and participants. You may raise your virtual hand also if you want to be acknowledged. While, while they're thinking of their question, uh, let me be the first one to ask. Um, you mentioned a while ago that there's, uh, there's a special curriculum for sports, and uh, it, it, it varies based on, if I got it correctly, it varies based on their, uh, their field or their, their event. Po, no? um, I'm just curious, how, uh, what's the process of actually identifying what are the curriculum content of, 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 of each special curriculum for sports education. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Joseph, for that question. No? Um, you know what? The, <clears throat> the curriculum of the National Academy of Sports is something that's very unique. Uh, the manner by which the curriculum was, uh, was planned is that for grades 7 and 8, uh, it will be sports infused. So looking at the existing uh, curriculum of our uh, junior high school, uh, what was done was to um, identify uh, the National Academy of Sports learning competencies and to plot and align that uh, with the most essential learning competencies um, of the Department of Education. So is it streamlined? Definitely it is streamlined uh, because there's a lot, um, there were um, several um, attempts and a validation also to unpack the standards of the Department of Education's um, curriculum. And again, align that to a sports-infused um, uh, curriculum and competency for grade seven and eight. What will be quite unique is the minute they step to grade nine and until grade 12, um, the curriculum will still have sports infusion, uh, but definitely it will be more um, uh, sports specific and sports specialized. Uh, and most of their um, performance tasks uh, will, be, uh, will be evaluated and assessed during their training um, in their particular sports because they have, they have um, the eight fo uh, focal sports uh, and then each um, student, let's say, for example, I am in badminton. So my assessments can also take place um, during my training in badminton or even in competitions um, late, later on. No? Because um, right now, we already have like online competitions, um, especially for taekwondo. Uh, and we are looking into the uh, possibility that there would really be um, a, a blended type of um, uh, uh, or a combination of online uh, of online competitions and also of on-site competitions. So, um, so that it remains to be a um, a a work in progress. Uh, and definitely, Joseph, the researches that we will be conducting in the next couple of months should really help us see whether we are in the right track, no, in terms also of work uh, of of doing the curriculum. So, um, that's really that's really a gift. Uh, the minute we get the, the results from the initial research uh, endeavors of the academy. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ma'am ma ma Malu. Thank you also, Apala, Ma'am, uh, for sharing yung kanina, yung different uh, topics to be explored pa further. I, I, think, I think it's a, it's like a, a preview on this, on this uh, conference. Nung makakawa sila ng mga topics na pwede nila i- pursue uh, in their education research. Yes, there's, there's so, really a lot, Joseph, to explore, no? 
um, as far as um, sports uh, education is concerned, um, the really CD one of the things that we would um, like to ano, no, to uh, to challenge our our students because the majority of our uh, sports education uh, topics related related palang sila, but wala pang masyadong researches um, as far as the sports academies are concerned. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have a comment here uh, from uh, Heinrich Roberts. Ma'am, since we are talking about sports, do you think online training is feasible or effective to our student athletes? Maybe he's referring to what you mentioned, uh, what, what the, the current setup of, of yes. uh, the slide, ma'am. Okay. Um. Thank you for that question. Uh. Just like what I said earlier, no. Uh. Most of us really question the manner by which the PE classes would be conducted, more so the varsity trainings, etc. Uh. But what um the gift that we have in the National Academy of Sports is that, um, the the training that they have in in uh in strength and conditioning, uh, is definitely aligned to the needs of a certain sport. Because you cannot come, uh, you cannot uh, put all your eggs in one basket. So you cannot train all the athletes doing the same strength and conditioning when the needs are different. And we have to be cognizant that there would definitely be screen fatigue. So you have to make sure that the students are also engaged in that kind of training, that they are engaged in the progress and the development of their own training. So um, this uh, the trainings that they have, uh, it's just conducted for one hour. Uh, but the actual training, uh, uh, the actual number of hours, if I'm not mistaken, that is only within um, 30 to 40 minutes, of course, with breaks in between. And then after which the students answer a what we call the NASPAD no, or the National Academy of Sports um, PAD. Um, we're in, they really, uh, they monitor and they, uh, and they document their progress for each day. Uh, for each day of training, and then they make an evaluation of that progress. Um, so definitely, there could be a lot of permutations that could come into play um, as far as training is concerned. Uh, but if you're going to ask on the feasibility, definitely it is feasible. Um, are there challenges? Definitely there are challenges uh, because you see one student moving differently um, or there could be some lags when it, um, as far as con uh, connectivity is concerned. No? Uh, but that is one of the things that we are working on right now as far as um, uh, our research initiative is concerned. We are exploring the, the satisfaction level and also the level of effectiveness of online um, learning, not only in PE classes, but also in their strength and conditioning uh, uh, training. So... Uh, Heinrich, if I pronounce your name correctly, uh, I hope that I will be able to share with you and to the rest of the participants uh, the result of the training. Uh, most probably will be able to collect that the first quarter of next year. We're, we're just waiting for the uh, we're just waiting for the approval uh, from the board uh, to conduct the research. Thank you, Maluno. It's something that uh, I think our sports. Uh, uh, science students and as well PE students, uh, PE education students would be looking forward to no, sa, uh, itong, itong result uh, in terms of uh, what what uh, Heinrich asked. Ma maybe last question for this morning. No? Ma'am Rita kasi a, a, a while ago because of, of the field work, the research uh, she did, no, uh, I think one of the ideas she raised a while ago is that in terms of teacher education situation, dapat meron ding and may major sana or may specialize sa indigenous uh, people's education no? because as mentioned ni Ma'am Rita iba-iba yung pangangailangan ng ng mga indigenous people sa iba't ibang lugar no so do you see the same thing for sports education do you think well of course we have the physical education uh, program no? pero do you also think na there's there's a need for 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 Philippine higher institution or higher education institution to somewhat offer uh, a program, a degree program that would actually uh, 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 train or teach teach people or, or aspiring uh, teachers, no, to specialize in how to manage instruction and assessment in terms yes. of sports education. 
um, that's definitely correct, Joseph. No, um, one of the um, the attempts of the sports track, um, as far as grades eleven and twelve are concerned, no, um, is to really uh, encourage our our students who will be uh, interested to pursue the track to explore different curriculum exits. Uh, because the, you will not just um, there are a lot of opportunities really uh, for our graduates to explore the different areas um, as far as teaching is concerned. Uh, we, uh, if you're going to pursue your sports track, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will you will be a coach, uh, you will be a, you will be a trainer, or you will be, let's say, for example. Um, uh, a sports manager. It's not only within that realm of sports, no. But you're also talking of sports, uh, of sports management, right? Um, you, and it would it would be because it's a totally different um training altogether. That's why we are really pushing for um uh, for more sports academies uh, to be created so that the, that the curriculum that they would uh, that they would have does not only train the student athletes, but at the same time provide also opportunities. Uh, for the fa uh, for the faculty uh, to be able to be trained better as far as sports um, education is concerned, uh, what I can see right now is that there are already initial steps um, on how to train. Let's say, for example, our um, our student athletes in sports um, specific uh, endeavors or sports specific sports, <laughs> uh, but there is a complementary training. And the sports industry is quite competitive. So there are certification um, courses uh, and even international certification courses that are necessary to be, uh, to be completed before you're also granted that opportunity to teach because not all um, coaches are able to teach as well. <laughs> so I think there's, there's a need. Um, going back to your question, Joseph, definitely there's a need to institutionalize, no? Um, the uh, the competence of a, of a teacher if he or she um, will be teaching a particular sport um, and later on consequently to be a coach or even a um, a strength and conditioning coach at that. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Ma ma I, I I kind of reflect na para by doing that we're also helping in etong uh, mga enthusiast natin sa sports na kasi mas lalawak yung career pathway nila. No? Kung gusto nilang i-continue yung uh, coaching, for example, or gusto nilang i-continue naman being an educator in, in terms of sports education, mas, mas maganda, mas maging mas malawak yung options nila in terms of career pathway. So it's 10.15, we, we already lack the time, so let me take this opportunity, Ma'am Malu, to thank you. Ma maraming maraming salamat po. I, we know that you're also busy for sharing these fresh ideas no, about sports education. Maraming maraming salamat po. Maraming thank you salamat po. Dyan, uh, din Joseph and congratulations for this community activity. Looking forward to your next one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, okay, so we, we have heard already our two keynote presentations and we hope that uh, having you to listen to, to, to these two presentations no, gave, gave you uh, fresh ideas on, on how to continue uh, being a student researcher or in the future professional uh, researcher. You know? And then uh, as mentioned, we hope that we use research you know, uh, and we view research not as an instrument or not as a requirement you know, in the workplace or in, in, in the class, you know, but, but rather, an instrument, a venue for us to advocate the things that we, we need to advocate, that the things that have a significant impact in the profession, you know, in, in the society on a macro scale. Okay, so it's time now to hear messages from our dear research facilitators. This is our message, uh, messages to you, our dear student researchers. Let's hear, hear it first uh, from our research course facilitator. Uh, Sir Raymart Pasanya. Sir Raymart, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Um, okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, to the student researchers of this semester, I would like to congratulate you for participating in our event, TURF 2021. And also, I love to congratulate you for accomplishing your task in educational research. Um, we all know that writing research is not easy, okay? So we all know that writing research is not easy. What more in this trying time? So 
today is the culmination of your fruit of favor, of your sleepless nights, brainstorming, discussions, and even endless revisions. So later in the afternoon, you are going to have your parallel session. It's time for you to present your study. Um, please be reminded to have an open mind and open heart to accept the feedback, the suggestions, and the constructive criticism coming from our um, panel of uh, coming from the members of the panel who are expert and have specialization on the field or the topic that you are exploring. So actually, this kind of activity is part of the research culture, not just for you as student um, researchers, but also as who are already working in the field. We also experience this kind of um, peer reviewing so that we can unleash the full potential of our study. We can maximize the novelty of our study. So later on, um, please take down some notes from the suggestion of our um, members of the panel and be confident in presenting your study. Do not forget to exhibit uh, the core values of FEU, which are fortitude, excellence, and uprightness. So good luck later and be brave. Thank you, Sir Joseph. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sir Raymond. I, I, I definitely agree with you. you know, na, the, the, the activity later this afternoon is just for our, uh, for our faculty to help our student uh, researchers. So have the open mind and open heart, Sir Raymond. Okay? Thank you, Sir Raymond. Now to uh, formally close our uh, uh, plenary session, let me call on our uh, research facilitator for the closing remarks, Sir Rizaldi. Sir Rizaldi, good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. As part of the university, we, as part of the university, is it's our responsibility to take part of this kind of endeavor, the research. Okay, I think they're having some technical difficulties. Uh, sir Saldi, medyo na naputol po kanina. Am I audible na, sir? Yes po, sir. Apa. Sige po, sir. Yes. Thank you po. As I was saying this morning, Doc Kusha shared to us her research on IP education and Doc uh, Kura's uh, perspective on sports in, in the Philippines. I hope that we have some takeaways on their study that will linger our curiosity towards another research work to do. Um, later this afternoon, you, our dear students, will present research work of your own. I hope this academic practice will ignite your personal passion in research in, a, in your own um, field of discipline. Thank you very much and good morning. Okay, thank you also, uh, Sir Saldi, for, for that uh, remarks. So we're now on the concluding part of the program. Again, let me thank everyone, our speakers, Dr. Pura and uh, Dr. Kusho for sharing their expertise you know, on indigenous people's education and sports education. Thank you so much. You know. And we thank all, uh, all our uh, guests uh, who, who joined us for this plenary session. And of course, we thank you, our, uh, our colleagues, you know, our faculty members, and our students who are here with us today on the plenary session of the Education Research Forum. The evaluation forum uh, link is accessible in the chat box. Uh, please don't forget to, uh, to answer our evaluation form. And to our guests, we hope to see you next semester uh, on our upcoming events in the undergraduate studies. So again, to our students or dear students, uh, we wish you well later on your uh, research presentation for uh, during the breakout session this afternoon. And uh, again, we thank everyone for being here with us today. Uh, in, in the plenary session of the Education Research for Maraming maraming, maraming salamat po and uh, we, we hope to see you 
soon on site na no, sa mga susunod nating mga programs and activities. Salamat po. Uh, have a nice day ahead. Uh, stay safe. Salamat. Thank you.